Francis Levy, co-director of the Philip Teddy Center, and welcome to Jazz Improvisation and the Written Word. Dr. Edwin DeSessian is the other co-director of the center. All of our Philip Teddy's roundtables segue into art exhibits and exhibitions that are curated by, mostly by Hallie Cohn, who is the director of the exhibition space. And this one is called The Architecture of Emotion, Interior and Exterior. So as you'll notice on the walls, we have some pictures of works by Vito Oconci, who is here on our psychogeography panel. Outside, you have photographs of interior space by Saul Robbins, who um, has actually done analyst offices. So we're dealing with kind of the phenomena of architecture on the inside and then the interior world and the, and the way we inhabit it architecturally. Now, all Philoctetes events are simulcast so that people in different parts of the world are watching Philoctetes. Uh, we have one person in Romania, we know, one person in South Africa. We actually see, uh, we, we can see who is watching. But if you happen to be at home and you want to see a Philoctetes event, you can just go to the Philoctetes site and see it. And all of our programming, if you go to past programs, programming on our site is available. So like in this week and in about the next uh, Thursday, I think this program will be up on the site and you can see um, the, um, this particular evening of jazz. So now, without further ado, please <laughs> silence your cell phones. And Jane Ira Bloom is a soprano saxophonist, composer, and a pioneer in the use of live electronics and movement in jazz. She is the winner of the 2007 Guggenheim Fellowship in Music Composition, the 2007 Mary Lou Williams Women in Jazz Award for Lifetime Service to Jazz, the Jazz Journalist Association Award, and the Downbeat International Critics Poll for Soprano Saxophone, and the Charlie Parker Fellowship for Jazz Innovation. Bloom was the first musician commissioned by the NASA Art Program and has an asteroid named in her honor by the International Astronomical Union. I want to get an asteroid. I, 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 that, I'd like to find out where I can get an you know, asteroid. I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> she has received numerous commissions composing for the American Composers Orchestra, the St. Luke's Chamber Ensemble, and Palabolas Dance Theater, integrating jazz performers in new settings. She has recorded and produced 13 albums of her music and holds degrees from Yale University and the Yale, uh, the Yale School of Music. Bloom is currently on the faculty of the New School for Jazz and Contemporary Music in New York. Jane will introduce the other panelists and sort of moderate any discussion that we'll have concerning the music tonight. Right. Thanks, Jane. Thank, thank you very much for that illustrious introduction. Thank you all for being here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Please thank. I love you. Let me introduce you to these extraordinary musicians who you've already heard accompanying Francis Levy, Jerry Grinelli on percussion, drums. <laughs> I was going to say, Jerry, electroacoustic percussion of the mind. <laughs> Usually Jerry's playing with electronics. Please let me introduce on slide guitar, on prepared guitar, David Tronzo. <laughs> on voice, Jay Clayton. <laughs> I'm, I'm just thrilled. These are, these are extraordinary musicians uh, coming here to perform for you this evening. I'll just tell you briefly. This, pro this whole idea came about, I think it's very uh, organic to the whole Philoctetes process because I got inspired by, I was attending a lot of the poetry conferences that were curated by Michael Braziller. And I got so involved in the poetry that I was thinking about, it made me think about the different ways, the different musicians who I've known have integrated words into their musical world. And we'll talk about it and we'll keep the conversation very fluid and open here. Uh, but we'll play for you, we'll talk a little bit, and you can see how different uh, all the various approaches are from each of uh, these musicians who are here and how special they all are. So let's start with a, a composition of uh, Jerry Grinelli's called Coming Through Slaughter. Just tell him a bit about it, Jerry. Um, <laughs> no. It's, um, this is a one section of a larger piece. I was inspired by a... a a writer named Michael Ondaatje, who um, who um, is a brilliant Canadian writer. He wrote The English Patient. But long ago, he wrote a book called Coming Through Slaughter. There's two very strong mythic figures in jazz. One is Robert Johnson, the great uh, blues guitar player. And the other is Buddy Bolden. Buddy Bolden was a trumpet player. And before Louis Armstrong, and there are no recordings of Buddy Bolden. There's one photograph of Buddy Bolden. It was, everything else was burnt up. 
And uh, Ondaatje did this fantastic book that goes between Buddy's mind and uh, some narrator's mind. And Buddy was, had a very tragic history. A slaughter was the mental institute, institution that they put, uh, particularly any African Americans, Americans who did anything weird in those days. They just locked them up. And Buddy spent third, the last 30 years of his life Never spoke, never played again. Uh, slaughter was a town they took him through. Uh, <clears throat> but in this book, please get it if you want to read it, it's beautiful. Uh, this, uh, these words that Tronzo is going to say is Buddy Bolden speaking about his lineage, his teachers, and how he got involved in all of this. Uh, the rest of it, I'll just give it away. <laughs> Let's do it. over barbed wire. Thank you. 
When I played the parade, we'd be going down Canal Street. And at each intersection, people would just hear the fragment I happened to be playing. And it would fade out as I went further down Canal. They would not be able to hear. Side of the brain, you, you keep your music. What you keep music on with one and words on the other, but for me, it's constantly shifting. Very hard. Yeah, you, know, you said you said a great line the other day. Um, that uh, for musicians, words are a second language, you know? <laughs> <laughs> which I love. It really speaks to something. Yeah. The idea is to, is to see if I can bring words and music together to produce a third product. Sometimes it works. I mean, that's what this was, is there's a third thing that's happening, which is, you know, sometimes they're flipping on top and back and forth. That's From a listener's point of view, how, does you hear the words? Does you hear, do you go back and forth in music, or do you hear it all at one? Yes. Do you hear meaning? Do you hear word sounds? <laughs> what do you hear? Yeah? We're reversing it. We're asking the question. Yeah, no, I'm curious. <laughs> I, I know what's going on in my mind, but, you know, when you're sitting out there, what's, what's, what's getting through? Yeah. <laughs> Did you hear a story? Did you hear the story? Yeah, yeah. It's like a film story to me. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah? That's great. That's spontaneous film story. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, if you've got the story, that's what's interesting, is where's that balance so the words are being served and the music is being served. You know, I mean, it's like, wow, that's really interesting, <laughs> that you can hear the story and you can follow that, and then there's the you know. The other aspect that I think is interesting in this anyway, so it's that uh, I don't ordinarily find myself at a microphone, obviously. <laughs> I, think you, I think you noticed that. Um, I'm very comfortable speaking to audiences and performing. Um, they, Jerry introduced this yesterday in, in going over some pieces for this, and I had to come up with a way of creating something to bring out this text, which is a really profound and moving uh, text, uh, particularly the story for me is, is very powerful, uh, given my uh, guitar playing and slide guitar playing with the origins of that are at the root of the same thing that Buddy Bolden comes from. Anyways, what I was doing while doing that was improvising. None of that was prearranged, with the exception of the bell tolling sound, which I, it was what my starting point yesterday, conceptually. But it's all prearranged, but of course the text is not. I'm actually having to bring the text out in some kind of way, almost not quite in character, but just to narrate well. But you know, so there's this one part is completely being improvised, and the other is not. It's not like they're equivalent in their range of mo motion or movement. Uh, but then the, where, they, you know, where this comes together is a very mystical point, which when you're an improviser of any kind, any kind of creative invention, it's a real edge area, and you have to trust it 100%. I mean, you have to trust 100%. It's literally like just, <laughs> you know. Not so much, I mean, me trusting that I was going to be able to do it. Trusting that the thing comes together in a certain way. Do you know what I mean? It's a bigger power. That's improvisational, and all of the music accompaniment, or, or I don't even yeah. call it accompaniment, the music that is interacting with was completely impro improvised. So you knew you had to get to the end of the text. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. yeah. We and had so. that feel tonight, because it's the first time you did that. Or oh, I, I live for it. It's just like... <laughs> so you, you have done this sort of thing. Um, no, no, I actually have never done this, but I, I, no, but I do it in my music all the time. I do it in, in playing. But not with words. But not with words. Not with words. Oh, this felt, this felt, um, I, I think I've finally grown up enough to be able to do it. Is getting ever career? Do you like rap in any way as far as you're concerned? You know, I don't think, I, I don't even think I've given it yet that much. Um, I have to digest this, this experience a little bit more. My, my reaction was it was very different from rap because the rap, the voice is always above, right. behind it. And, and I think it was, it was started that way when it right. was just you and the guitar. But the moment that Jim came in, the text Correct. became sort of another instrument. Exactly. And, and it, it, uh, it changed everything. Yeah, I think and that's really important. environment that's more uh, 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 in the country, you know, you, you accept this kind of no beginning, no end to the, to the environmental sound picture, the visual picture, and, but I think we've become so accustomed to uh, music being in these discrete starting, ending forms, and, and we've lost that thing. I love the idea that Buddy Bolden only liked to play parades, because he only wanted you to hear this little segment of this ritual event, and you filled in the rest. That's very powerful, and it, yes, I could go on forever about it, but we're going to stop. Yes? Yeah. Let's play another composition of Jerry's. Uh, this is Raga and 
having a big mouth. Jay, how did you? <laughs> yeah, this happens to be another Jerry, but I brought it to the thing. Yeah, I, I, I just want to make that this is a segue. But I'm, I'm a word person. I mean, I am the, I'm the word person. I'm the singer, you know. And so, of course, we know that words evoke sound. Uh, yeah, I mean, standards are like that. I mean, whatever the words are, evokes emotions, evokes ideas, whatever. But for me lately, lately, I don't know, 10, 20 years. <laughs> no, but particularly more lately. Um, what happens for me, because I am a free, I do, do do a lot of free improvisation. I was here in the 60s when everybody was doing it. So what happens with me now is I, I got so into this, E.E. Uh, e. Cummings more than anything, but Emily Dickinson, and there's so in, certain poetry that has come in my life, I memorize, and it, it kind of helps me make meaning of the world. But what happens to me now is that sounds, the, my, the improvisers I choose to work with, evoke the poetry. So I don't, many times I plan it, but many times now it's so, it's kind of cool because whatever's happening, then this, this poem, comes to my mind, which I, I happen to know, you know, so it's my little vocabulary. So in this particular next piece, which I do a lot, uh, I like, it's a free structure that Jerry uh, uh, made years ago, which goes a long way. Uh, for real improvisers, we don't need much on the page. We, wait do you see this page. But, uh, <laughs> it's it's no, really, it's, it's a graphic, graphic score, but I mean, it goes a long way, so uh, it, it, we will, it evoked a certain E.E. E. Cummings poem that you will hear in a moment. Mm -hmm. And I find it's, of course, very valuable for this tough times that we're in. So check it out. Mm -hmm. Raga. This is Raga. Pardon me? Jay? Jay, is this, the, is this the same as scat? You called it voice. You're the voice. Is it scat? Oh, what I'm doing? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll tell you the truth because I teach a lot. Um, I'm improvising wordlessly. The word scat has a connotation for more of the bebop scat, you know. So I am scatting, but I, I choose to call it soloing, you know, improvising freely. There's a, but I am scatting, yes. I mean, but the, it originated with the bebop kind of sound. So when you say scat, I think of John Hendrix. But I am. Yeah, I'm scat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so here comes Raga. Hmm? Okay. <laughs> Born to go. Oh, 
Scatting. You were scatting. Yeah, we're scatting. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. That's right. Let's say it's getting close to speaking in tongues. Yeah. But I say that, I mean, because the people have said that, but there's, I will say one more thing about this because, I, you know, I've done this for a long time. I don't know what I'm doing, but I do believe that uh, that all sounds are are attached to emotion, and I know that it is. I but I would never deign to even care which ones are attached to which. But I I do teach this stuff, and I believe that whether we're going to scat or just do you know do songs, we're trying to to dig in there and express ourselves. And this is a vehicle. If you do this stuff, you you find stuff. And yeah, it's kind of another language. Our second, our first language, is that what you said? Yeah, yeah. yeah. this is our first language. Music is the first, our first language. <laughs> I, always, uh, I always wonder, particularly when you're improvising so quickly between word and meaning and sound, from, uh, from a listener's point of view, um, how, I don't know, how you, you guys all grab on to meaning as deeply as you do to, you know, some musicians hear sound and they just hear sound, some musicians hear a word and it's, it, they, it doesn't even translate into meaning. It just becomes the sound, word sound. So the, the balance between what, what, you're, what you mean when you say, that's the extraordinary thing about what she does. No, but I, but I do, I believe that, that sound and all of that still follows the message. So I, I, for me, the message is still it, no matter what environment I'm singing in, and that's how I choose poetry and that's how I choose song that out of the message comes feeling, comes phrasing, you know comes yeah. these sounds that are attached intuitively to something. To, but to meaning yeah. to meaning, to, to, meaning, to, to yeah. message yeah. I, my word, I like the sounds of words but that's second to the meaning yeah. but it, the sounds come out of the meaning I believe with my whole heart the, the longer I sing and the longer I teach I know that's the most important thing whether it be an emotional message or a 
actual literal yeah. message. It's because when I hear you, I believe what you're saying. <laughs> I believe you. I do. <laughs> no, I, that's the big compliment. Yeah. That's yeah. But you don't have a subtext. Uh -huh. A subtext? To let it go, for instance? Well, no, when you say no, but that would, of course, words. we know. I think we would have, yes. When you say when you don't use words, when you're just using... Do, do I have a literal words. subtext? Yeah. No. No, I don't think so. No. But there's still some kind of message going emotion. on, I believe, in my heart, yeah. When it's happening. I mean, you know, it's it always it's <laughs> interesting because the words, they literally project the emotion. When I think of sound, you got it. If I make a sound, you know, you can say, oh, that's uh, World War Seven, you know, or that was like a bird. That's yours. Oh, but it would have a meaning for me even if I didn't have the language. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I don't sound, that be the same. But I'm saying, what, for me, is, and I don't know, if I say something, the words, when Jay said that, it's really, and Jay, it's like really important that you have to honor the meaning of the word you're saying. But when you take away the word and you just go, do it, do it there. You can do me. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that for me, that's what's interesting is, as an audience, you got it. It means whatever you want it to mean. I have no sub. I have no. Yeah, whatever. Just if it touches you, I don't care how. Yeah, that's it. That's really interesting. Yeah. If you tell me how. If it touches you. If it evokes something in you. This is a perfect segue, Jerry. Yes. Just oh. shift. To shift. Keeping oh, to a composition of, of uh, Tronzos, because uh, we're talking about this very same thing about the, the interplay that goes on between words or lyric and instrumentalists as it has traditionally in the music and as it's expressed today by David. So the idea that's behind this a little bit is uh, a couple of things. One is that, say in the jazz idiom, whatever this is, jazz is a big word, maybe not even the right word, but in the improvised music idiom, the idea of what we play, whether you call it a solo or the composition, is really a storytelling exercise, in a way. Um, very deep way, actually. And I believe that, you know, uh, this is an opinion of mine, that we've, we've learned to put in this culture, uh, in, the, in, in our culture in the U.S., we've learned to put a demand on music that music doesn't really want. Music doesn't need to be validated by some, you know, understanding from the audience. It needs to be just immersed in. And uh, language and music are very similar in the brain. That's what they know now. In brain function and how it's learned and, how, and what it does in the brain, the areas of the brain that it lights up, so to speak. Because language and music are going to be endlessly improvised. They cannot be learned by rote. You have to be able to create whatever sentences you need to express whatever you need to express. No, no, this is completely off the top. And, um, and actually, this is just, well, so I'm not going to go on too long about it, but just keep in mind that uh, the connection between language and music in the brain is now known to be equivalent and singular in the fact that it is not able to be learned by rote. How is music taught? By rote, all the time. But language is never taught by rote, in reality. Uh, anyways. As improvisers, my whole thing is speech patterns in playing, speech patterns in the player. So a player comes along, and I'm a slide guitar player, and I've brought the slide guitar into 21st century music, basically, a, a thing that has an idiom in, in folk blues. And in folk blues, Delta style, whatever, in America, these things, the speech patterns in the music was profound. And the next time you see these speech patterns in players playing is in, like, Ornette era pre-improvisation in jazz. So we're going to do a little demonstration of that.
Absolutely. As a matter of fact, it's probably coming through this little mic. I'm, I'm always going. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, man. I had a couple of reactions. they're doing now with uh, children in education, small children, like uh, first year of life, they're, the idea is that, um, that if, they're, if they're exposed to music of all types, any type basically, it speeds their uh, skill acquisition process, and, um, but particularly language skills. And uh, also that there are a couple of um, neurologically based genetic disorders that impede, they're related to um, uh, 
social dysfunction and lack of ability to understand music go together, which refutes the entire idea of jazz musicians being bums, <laughs> if you think about it. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like, you know, they, we think that people think we're social, socially a little, you know, yeah. decrepit. But, you know, we can play our behinds off. But, no, but the point being, like, you know, they have this, there's this idea that, and they, they know from uh, public school education that, that when the music courses are no longer uh, basic curriculum, all of, the, all of the scores fall in all the other subjects. But this is going a little far afield, except to say that that origin has everything to do with how instrumentalists are relating to music. They're not just relating to it as melody. They're relating to it almost as syntax. I mean, just analyze the melody of, of a speaking voice. It's extremely complicated. Yeah. Question, uh, would you like question about that piece you just played? Um, I don't know how much it was improvised, how much of it was predetermined directions, but there were, these, there were definitely very clear blocks of music happening mm. through the development. And each of those blocks seemed to be a drastic contrast to the previous one. How much of that was, like, you know, a lot, a lot of those things were very idiomatic to me, anyway. I could hear very clear directions of those things coming from. It. Do you feel that there's like a, a linguistic value to that, or is that something that I'm maybe imposing on it as a listener because of my experience? Or is that, as improvisers, is that something that uh, the artist uses as a tool to provoke the music of their I think that's the, the latter, the final one. It's a, it's a tool of our institutions. I, I think, anyways. When I wanted to interpret uh, music that was lyric music, let's say I wanted to cover a song that had lyrics, but I wanted to do it instrumentally, I didn't have access to the Im intense emotional range of the, of the story that could be colored by like a, a sentence, you know, paints a whole picture. And then when married to the right, melody or timbre, you know, that you lose all that. So I thought, well, what does an instrumentalist do to paint this huge emotional range that's contained in this thing? Like in one sentence, there'll be several emotions layered together, you know, grief and relief and, you know, anger and a sort of, and whatever, you know, who knows what, happiness and, and longing put together. And I think that what you do is you take your vocabulary and, it, and you, you make these analogs that... Not that there's a, a sound for sad, but there's a way of painting the picture with this larger range of, of musical tools, contrast, dynamics, timbres. But every, every sound that you hear in this ensemble is the reflection of an individual personality, you know, right. as complex as that is. Right. Um, you know, again, I, I, I feel this, this heading exactly toward a piece that you had prepared for you. Because we were thinking about, you know, we had gone in this zone, then we thought, hey, where has the music come from That's in right. terms of lyric and melody? And we decided we should sing, we should play standard uh, and show you what we do with that. With that. Mm -hmm. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we thought we'd play uh, "Wild as the Wind," uh, Dmitri Tiomkin and, and Ned Washington. Ned Washington, 1950s, right? About. <laughs> Just a small child. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, 
Like a leaf clings to a tree Oh my darling, cling to me For we're creatures of the wind And wild is the Is my love for you? Whether it's voice or whether it's instrumental, but, you know, the back and forthing of what words mean to a musician. Um, well, for example, when I play a ballad, I, I'm, I know the lyrics. I'm so, in a sense, I'm seeing them in my head. And I actually learned this song from Jay years ago. So not only do I sing it in my head, but I actually hear your voice and your phrasing. <laughs> yeah. But. Uh, it wouldn't sound the same if I didn't know the words, the way I phrase, the way I think, the way it comes out. So, you know, there's this constant, in, in our improvisation, this constant back and forth thing that's going between the vocalist inspires the instrumentalist. I'm inspired by the words. I, I know what, what they are. I'm singing them. Then I play. I add whatever it is I do on a saxophone. Then it bounces back to a singer, and they're sometimes influenced by the instrumentalist. 
Oh, yeah. I tell all singers to listen to instrumentalists and all instrumentalists to listen, listen to, to singers. singers. I mean, as a teacher, that's like not optional. I just yeah. believe right. it. You know. That's right. Yeah. It's just wonderful. Uh, have you ever heard of... I was very interested in this lineage. Actually, when I'm teaching students in schools about ballads, I play the Louis Armstrong playing You Go to My Head, right? Louis Armstrong. He's, he, he's, he plays it first on the trumpet, and then he sings it, right? You listen to that phrasing. Then I go back, and I listen to Billie Holiday singing You Go to My Head. And when Billie Holiday was coming up, she listened to Louis Armstrong's trumpet. <laughs> you can hear her correct, yeah. popping some of his phrasing. Then after that, I, you know, I'll listen to uh, Frank Sinatra, who listened to Billie Holiday. <laughs> And you can right. hear all this back and forth thing going on. You know, it's really quite wonderful. But that's how it really is. <laughs> it's not like, well, this happened and I, it was. It's just constantly right. informing each other, back and forth. Anyway. Well, you know, it, it, this was an interesting choice of tune, it seemed to me, because there's, a, there's another element, which is the image of the wind, which has its own oral thing. And, and yeah, what I. Hmm? Well, yes, wind instrument, but I don't know if it's correct. I sort of felt like you were interacting with the melody. You were improvising off the melody. The drummer was improvising off, I thought, the image of the wind. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, really. That, yeah, no, that's like, that's so literal for me. I, I'm singing those words. Uh -huh. I've, I mean, you know, it's ridiculous for a drummer. To be, but I'm back here singing those words. Uh, and if I'm improvising off anything... It's uh, Nelson Riddle, the arranger. When I'm doing it like this, in my head, I'm hearing the strings, you know, and the whole orchestra from listening. Well, I thought there was a kind of a riddle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Listening to, great, listening to great singers and the backgrounds, and then learning all these songs, you know, because I work with great singers in my life. And having, and I learned all those, the lyrics. I'm playing the lyrics. That's my strongest. Do you believe us, Jerry? Well, they love to sing. Do. Fly away so, so with you. The <laughs> also, yeah. There's a sort of a middle term. There's the, the melody that you, you return to, the melody and the words. Yeah. Whereas before you were improvising off each other and whatever you were giving each other. Mm -hmm. Which, yes. Yeah, this had this had the most structure, uh, yeah. yeah, pre-structure. Well, pre-structured and pre. I mean, has a history to with it, and, and so. Mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. But you see, I actually have probably the most recent history with this actual song, because this is the first time that I'm mm -hmm. actually performing with Jane and with Jay Clay. Jerry and I work together, and he's worked, and they've worked all together, and so. In a way, the one thing that we um, talk a lot about, especially uh, we work a lot with young musicians about this, is that when you have a, a, a song that you know could be interpreted as you know like this song is about the wind, you know, it's like okay, well that's cool, um, but how about the story? When you mentioned subtext, how about the story that's never told about, or the one that no one knows about? the wind or what it's done or where it comes from or whatever. if you're going to go that route look at the story that isn't there if you're thinking in those terms and that's an amazing thing to do you know and there's it's like there's that the words of that song and then there's a spontaneous right. conversation going on with so there's there's the conversation and the, the meaning of the words which were Jay's a great singer because she serves that first when you sing a song, you know, she sings that song. So she's serving those words. Is that, I mean, that's like her, you know, she gets very upset if someone doesn't. When she hears a singer who doesn't serve those words, who's just using them. You can correct me here. Maybe not. You don't have to. You're right so far. <laughs> anyway, it, it, there's a conversation and a story going flipping all of this topic and then within and, and then out of it. Well, I have a very basic question about the conversation, which is how do you, you know, I work with a lot of patients who have creative inhibitions, for instance, and the, the biggest one is sort of how to start and how to overcome the critical aspect of it. How do you, 
how do you know when it's going well, and how if, if, it, if you don't feel that it's going well, how do you how do you, how do you go how do you keep going but go but change it? You know, how do you say, okay, this isn't working right now, but let's keep doing it. Go ahead. Yes. There's always another day. <laughs> no, but, no, but, no, but this could have. I think that's a good question. Yeah, because two, two, two for two things. First of all, we are we are working off of each other. But at some point, when it's the best thing that could happen is this music gets a life of its own. Now, I really believe that, and I know that happened a couple of times tonight. This is there's very little planned, and, and especially that when you're here is nothing. So it so it does or it doesn't. You know when it's you know when it's flowing. One thing about, like you say, because every time I talk to my students, every, all of a sudden, if you're thinking and you start going, uh-oh, this isn't going well, blah, 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 because that happens to everybody. You know what the best thing is? Take the horn out of your mouth. You know? No, but I really believe that from the, you know, so the thing is, maybe, because remember, it's subjective, too. Right. You know, so that's right. You're, it's a very good question. So sometimes you're, you start to think, and that means you're kind of outside of the music. We like to be inside all the time, and at, the, at its best we are. But once everybody, I don't care, the greatest. There's going to be that one time, and you start. Peacock used to call it voting. Voting. Uh, <laughs> voting. Voting. He used to call it voting because in <laughs> Gary Peacock, come on. I bet he never votes. No, because he's wonderful. No, but we all want, you know. But the, it's a good question. So. The best thing you can do is you go, space. And, and you, if you leave space, there's, the music is happening. Maybe you're not a part of it right then, and you, you're voting, so you know. And <laughs> something will come, or not, you know. Or you've just made a fantastic trio. <laughs> Or <laughs> and that's you're the only one that can actually. Yeah. So, but it's a very good happen. question. The only thing that can happen, I just have to say, is that um, uh, it's a musician or anyone engaging in a creative pursuit is well advised to be very, very, very suspect of the judgmental, critical mind. Very suspect of it. Um, you know. It's just, yeah, it's real, it's really, it's sort of like, thanks for sharing, I'll get back to you, uh, uh, email me tomorrow, we'll have lunch, you know, and you, you just go on. Because literally sometimes, uh, well, I find this all the time in the, in the work that I do in music, and I think this is shared by my colleagues, is that we're often in, in an environment of uh, creating something that has no precedent fully, but it has, it has physics, so to speak. It has structural things that we're thinking about. We're also musicians. So one of the worst things musicians, I think, can do, for example, in, 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 when you talk about music specifically, is get caught up in music criticism. You know, we have, that's a, really, it's none of my business what's happening, especially what I'm doing. It's sort of like, do it and get out of there. And watch what happens later. Like, I'll do that. Another I'll day. A, we'll bring a recording home, and we'll take the mixes, and you throw them in a the drawer. And I have this rule. It's three weeks. Put them in a the drawer. You wait three weeks. And you take them out of the drawer three weeks later and you put them in the machine and you go, wow, that was much better than I <laughs> thought when I got it. Because you get tired or, you, you know, whatever. But, yeah, be suspect of the critical mind. Lester Banks. Oh, man, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, you know, I mean, really, I, right I, along. I, leave to, yeah, I just leave it up to everyone to have their own connection to it and you decide what it is. I, what I found for myself was um, uh, I could dislike anything. <laughs> Liking it is the challenge. Loving it is the goal. What are we going to do with uh, <laughs> this? Yeah. So to speak. Maybe we can uh, ask Miguel to uh, yeah. start the tape. Uh, we're going to play a composition of mine called Most Distant Galaxy, which actually I, I performed here the first time I played. But this was inspired, uh, this performance was inspired very much by a spontaneous reaction to a, a, some poem, poetry I have been listening to, some, you know, I've been reading. And so this came about. So if uh, Miguel will hit it. <laughs> and if I say one word about this beautiful music is happening, but um, as a, I, I do a lot of poetry, I usually memorize it, but I've been doing it so long, and she came in, because she knows I like Emily Dickinson too, and she, has heard this Emily Dickinson with this environment. So I'd like to, and I really like it. So. Here comes Emily. 
her goodbye. A moment. We uncertain step for newness of the night. Then fit our vision to the dark and meet the road erect.
the darkness alters or something in the sight adjusts itself to midnight and life steps almost that piece years ago. I was commissioned by NASA and I got a press release in the mail. It was 1988 uh, from the then head of the NASA art program, which was all about, I, I think I brought it with me. Yeah, um, yeah here it is, Washington, D.C. Press release August 8, 1988. Most distant galaxy detected. Astronomers at NASA's Space Telescope Science Institute have uncovered the most distant galaxy yet seen. And it, you know, it goes on to describe it. But the key, the key things I remember underlining in this you know, press release, researchers find that such galaxies have a distinctive radio spectrum, which peaks and then drops off at a much faster rate than found in nearby radio galaxies. This ultra steep spectrum indicates that the galaxies are intrinsically quite luminous. Uh, so, I mean, that, that was, believe it or not, that was a different relationship to words, but that was the phrase that got me going on that piece. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. The rest is history. <laughs> Jerry and I have been playing this piece for quite a long time. He originated the part. That part that you hear on the recording was actually performed by Jerry when he has his electronics, but not today. <laughs> Are those things audible or translatable into sounds by not the radio spectrum of a galaxy. Actually, yes. I, I did get some, yeah. Really? They did send me some. You, you could. Did you, did you use any of those sounds? In? Just uh, not in a, you know, a, a direct way. I, I let it, I just let it in. project a Make sense of various patterns that one is getting from celestial objects. Hmm. And she'll come up with the whales and the seals getting like three centers. Then you go on the road. Have a huge tour. Work all the time. A huge tour. Yeah, it's intergalactic. Work all the really big rooms. Yeah. Making it new to the extreme, and you know, it's just some new discussions you and I. Yesterday, how you come to Phil Tainey's uh, poetry uh, evening with Alice and Mike Brazilla talking about Emily Dickinson. And here you take something else and it becomes, here we had the poetry of Emily Dickinson, but now this, you've made something. 
totally different than that. that. And, and I've never heard the poem read in quite that way either. I mean, it's, it's, it's remarkable. It's, and it's not a distortion either. It is just something, as I say, it's making it new. It's making it new. Check this out. The idea came to me in rehearsal yesterday. <laughs> I had actually written, I had spent some time with the poem, Michael, because I, I got so turned on by Emily Dickinson, I bought the complete works, I've been deeply into it. And I, I, I remember I wrote this melody, um, which we didn't play. <laughs> but then we got to rehearsal, and there was something happening about we were playing this thing. I looked at the poem, I said, uh, it was just like mm. bing. And I threw out the melody that I had written, and that'll get played some other day, you know? It's, it's like extemporizing, you know, it, 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 it's a wonderful thing with the proposition that we, that we actually see in the process. Right. Okay. It, it's like it reminds me of that famous film of Pollock Payne that you, you know, the, 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 the can't say the name of the film, where you actually see him doing the dance with the brush. Yeah. Try to, try to imagine us as four brushes, because really, right. the four of us have never played together before, really, this group. So you're watching the brushes uh, right. paint together here. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that's the exciting part that really, like composing together, is trusting, have a lot of trust open. And, uh, and, the, and the only thing we, what the rehearsals is about is, is I, I call them points of departure. We, we have uh, I, ways in and ways out. And the point of departure is, is sometimes written. We've had some written things, but it, it kind of sets up a character. So it is free, but it really does, it, you know, it's like, and then we depart. But this was... Yeah, I like to see. Yeah, Alex, I know very little about music and, and jazz, but is it is, are, is jazz the, one of the, the forms that seems to um, relate to other forms more than what I would call classical music? I mean, it just seems to me that maybe it's just because I know it through you, Jane, but you know, your, your album, Chasing Paint, is a picture of a Pollock on it, or a Pollock's painting on it. And the way you, the four of you are talking tonight is just the most extraordinary moment for me to see these, these things coalesce and to hear the references and the metaphors and the way you, you seem to be so engaged in so much in the world. I mean, I, I'm not sure that you're a political... Uh, <laughs> But at least we're, we're, we're really covering so much, and even in this format that you've created of, of the word, I think it's just... So that's the essence of improvisation. In other words, we everything we've ever heard in our life, everything individually that we've ever heard, Comes, comes out, we can yeah, use. Yeah. We don't even, not with our minds, but, but I mean, you, you can it, only improvise what something minded, though. It's, 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 if I may say something about our lineage, yes. you know, the image of the jazz musician, and I say lineage because we all know exactly who our teachers were, and none of us are self made. Mm -hmm. We are a product of those people who put their bodies across the wires for us. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these were really intelligent, intelligent people who had this, you know, wild and crazy image. Mm -hmm. Outlaws. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I like Billy the Kid. You know? And I think I, part of the reason I became a jazz musician is because the gunslingers weren't popular anymore. You know, like outlaws. <laughs> <laughs> Outlaw quality, does that make sense? And, but these people were, you know, the Buddy Golden, the Louis Armstrong, the Dizzy Gillespie, the Charlie Parkers, and, uh, Bill Evans, and all the, on and on and on. These were really, you know, like pretty interesting people if you got to speak to them. And that's not the image or the portrayal of the outlaw. It, you know, and uh, so yeah. These, you know, these eagle lesbians that they're playing chess by the hour. Yeah, but um, don't you know, you know your teachers, but you also know your teachers' teachers and like, their teachers and like that. So that the, the continuation of, of just of the whole idiom, it's, it's, it's not a set thing that it's a growing, it's, it is like the universe. It's, it's a lot. It's yeah, a lot right. and expanding. Um, and I find it interesting because when I but I hear improvised music without words, without uh, uh, assigned words as assigned meaning. Um, it goes back to something that Jerry said 
earlier is I get to assign my meaning to that thing. As soon as a vocabulary of a of known quantity of words, the English language, the uh, sort of, sort of them, um, comes into play, then, then that process for me kind of stops. But something else happens, which is just as equally beautiful. I have the meaning and the deeper meaning of those words. And it goes back to, it was interesting to hear you bring the idea of phrasing when you guys did the, the standard, because that's what I was thinking about the whole time. Like, a different artist would phrase it differently and it meant something different to me, even though the words were the same. And how each one of you, or each artist, phrases, and it, that that kind of play, it just, it's, it's a, that, to me, that's like a really, yeah, that's just that's, those are the things that I notice the most, and um, what happens for me when I hear just instrumental music and my mind my the journey that I go on. Yeah. Yeah, that's right on. I mean, I think that um, uh, one thing about the lineage, the momentum of the lineage, is that. Each person was really, uh, each person whose contributions were really strong, they were grounded in something very simple. Like the concept was kind of simple. It's not esoterica, you know, it's really, it's, it's real fundamentals. It's real basic stuff. And uh, even in terms of forms and things like specific to our art form, um, so the question was brought up, like, it seems like this could relate to a lot of other things. I think anything that's grounded in sort of fundamental blocks of basic, you know, stuff that's, yeah, that's, that's common to a large uh, experience. So it's, I call it music physics, you know, it's, 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 it basically it's physics. And it's a physics of emotions, too. It's an emotional language. And this stuff is then, uh, because I have this belief that there's not that much really universal about music in and of itself as this art form. And I've, I've traveled around the world, and you go from one region of one area of one country to another region, and they don't relate to what you just did in the last place, where it went over great. That idea has come up in all of these series. Jane played with the a Chinese, a right. Chinese, a yeah. player, and an Indian player. That that was the sentiment. Also, right. that they came from three different musical theoretical traditions. Right. And then we had this guy David Grubbs, um, this folk band. That David Grubbs is actually a well-known avant-garde musician, but he was playing right. hong kong basically, <laughs> and, and he said exactly the same thing. It was all music. Right. Right. The core thing. Well, we'll play something and then we'll get back to talking. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think these guys are very interested in, in process. Sounds like Let, it. Let's, let's take Jay's piece. Um, Lines fast, and spaces. Hold fast the dreams. Actually, the other one. Oh, right. You see, that's, that's why we're doing it. <laughs> oh, because I don't know it? No. <laughs> <laughs> because we didn't rehearse it. You think it's right? Right. We didn't rehearse this piece. We can end up with this one. Okay. It's more accurate. Hang on. Uh, you know, Where did you go? We don't have to do this. We don't have to do the, the written part. We can, I just get more. I'll, I'll do the two poems together somehow. Okay. Of course, I need to look at that. Sometimes we have, a, okay, just move. Sometimes as improvisers, I, what's fun is like, well, it, it, only people we know but that, that improvise. We have a battery of material, but again, we don't always know what, when to do what, because this comes out of free stuff. Remember that one? So sometime, one time Jerry was like, we were thinking, he just, you know, you know, right. and that's it. You know, I mean, you, you can do it musically, but really, it's, sometimes it's so obvious what's next. Let's do this next. Let's do it. That can 
Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sore and then run? Oh. Does it stink like rotten meat? Oh. Jerry, can we finish up with your poem? Oh, yeah. Would that be okay? Yes. She had a question. Oh, I'm sorry, you had a question. That's right. Dick, you said you just saw the words yesterday. To the first piece of the evening. The first piece. Uh, it's, it's been on my mind. Um, did you rehearse in your mind in any way since first seeing the words and then, in other words, did you read it again or did you read it for the second time tonight or was there any preparation for the combination of the two? Yeah. We did that yesterday, maybe sort of not quite two times through, because the whole effort was also formulating what we thought might could be some possible outcomes of how we would arrange it. But it's left a little bit open. And then, um, and then we did it again just prior to the audience. The lyrics are, are, are set. Right. And the several times that you played, was the music improv each time different? Mm. Uh, very much so. With the exception of the spell tone I that I, requ I, I wanted to have you know asked. Why I asked the question why it's been on my mind or is it because it seems to me your, your mental process, your ability to, if I wrote as it were, say the words and then originate, compose at the same time. And there you go. With one going off the other one. Yeah, there you bunch go. Of guys. It's, it's there was one thing that would play off you, but he played off himself. <laughs> well, he's playing off the Well, he's like that. <laughs> we go back That's a long true. ways. <laughs> That's very good. So we'll close well, with well, yeah. yeah, it's I don't even understand the actual thing that's happening, yeah, but I trust a hundred percent that if I leap, the ground will nat naturally appear. That's a hundred percent. On some part of his body, the ground will Yeah, right. Sometimes, sometimes his head first, but... You want to do this? Yeah, well, there's, there's a nice segue talking about words we see words. the first... We're going to finish off with a poem of Jerry's. We're going to do something uh, jazz musicians almost never do. We're going to speak. All at once. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We don't know it. What? You don't know it? I don't know. <laughs> Is this a tag ending? Code ending? No. Yeah. Silly. Just. How could I know what you are? How could I, I know, know what, what you are? are? How could I know what you are? How could you see what, what I've seen? How could you see what I've seen? What I've seen? How could you, how could you dream what I dream? How could you dream what I dream? You've never seen what I've seen. You've never seen what I've seen. You've never been where I've been. You've never been where I've been. You've never dreamed what I've dreamed. You've never dreamed what I've dreamed. How could you know what I've You've never dreamed what I've dreamed. How could you know what I've dreamed? You've never dreamed what I've dreamed. 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 You've never dreamed what I've dre
But what you mean. Ben, what you I know, know what, what you mean. mean. See what you see. I've never been dream. where you've been. See what, what you see. Been what you dream. What, what you dream. I know what you mean. See what you see. Been what you see. Dream what you dream. Know what you dream. You dream. Because I've been where I've been. You never seen what I've seen. Because I've been where I've been and dreamed where you dreamed.